next one is flax. And this one is not as well known as soy in terms of its hazards, but flaxseed by weight in compared to soy is three times higher in phytoestrogens. However, I don't think there's many people eating anywhere near much as, as much flax as soy, although you're going to be eating a lot of it if you're eating in the raw food. It's often called the raw foodist's uh, version of soy. If you're eating a lot of flax crackers, grinding it up and adding it to smoothies, the lady, taking in a lot of flax oil. Um, flax oil, although it doesn't have some of the estrogens that are in the fiber, it does still have the lignans, which are very high. It's not as high in phytoestrogens, but it's still very high. And we just, I personally don't believe we need any of it. Uh, a better thing for crackers, if you're a raw foodist, is chia seeds. They gel up in the same way. They're a more complete protein source. They have better chem uh, minerals in it and they're not anywhere near as high as phyto in phytoestrogens, although they do have um, phyto very small amounts of phytoestrogens in them because they're a seed, they're not as uh, insanely high as flax. Then we've also got some things like uh, black beans, sesame seeds, these are also very high. In terms of fruit, the highest fruit that contains phytoestrogens is grapefruit, and then another very high source in mainstream diets is uh, hops, hops used in virtually all beer production. I believe it's actually uh, a law for most commercial beer products to have hops in them. Uh, I'm not totally sure on that, but hops is in basically in all commercial beer. So that is a very widely used phytoestrogen that is causing the feminization of men. You see men that have very high body fat, very low muscle tone, that consume a lot of beer, whereas the uh, vegetarians or raw foodists that are consuming a lot of flax and soy, their version of the feminization is very low uh, body mass, also low body fat, but very low muscle uh, tone. So it's the same idea except hops, because of the caloric content of alcohol, it's going to be putting on fat, whereas both uh, the health foodists as well as the um, more beer drinking type average people are both very uh, have poor muscle tone, poor strength, and have feminizing qualities, prostate problems in a long time, increased risks of all sorts of cancers, infertility. Infertility rates in North America are soaring, as well as throughout the um, civilized world, as we want to can call it. Certain herbs that are very high in phytoestrogens are things like licorice root, that's by far the highest. Although I'm a proponent of Chinese licorice root, um, lately I haven't been consuming it because after I found this out, and I do know it has uh, benefits to it. It's a great tonic herb. However, um, its use in ancient China was at a time when they didn't have all these synthetic and excessive uses of estrogen mimicking chemicals. So um, its use might not be so necessary today. We can find other things that do similar things. Um, jujube dates are a great way to bring um, unification of a herbal tonic formula as opposed to licorice root. Um, and if you're someone who avoids all phytoestrogens and has, doesn't take in um, xenoestrogens, then perhaps uh, licorice root could be something you use here and there. Another very high one is black cohosh root. And also both of these could be used if you're in a situ situation where you need estrogen mimicking, mimicking chemicals from plants that you'd be prescribed by an herbalist or a bioidentical hormone specialist. And then also uh, shizandra berries and hoshubu are somewhat high in phytoestrogens. And I talked about hoshubu before as being great for sexual health, and it's true. However, it does have slightly feminizing qualities, and um, if you're really in a tough place with your hormonal health, you might want to drop that one, find another source of zinc. But uh, I still take both of those in their respective qu quantities, but I am aware of that, and I go to other means to include phytoandrogens in my diet. But first of all, I'd like to talk about xenoestrogens and the sources of these. Like I said, all sorts of plastics, BPA, um, basically any plastic is going to be uh, estrogen mimicking, but different plastics have different solubility and their ability to wear off and get into the, our food supply, get into our body if we're touching our skin. And the off-gassing of certain plastics, the rate of this is going to be different with different types of plastics. But basically all plastics are xenoestrogens and we want to eliminate them as much as we can in our lifestyle. And this is a process uh, over the long term that we can incorporate. Uh, another very hor horrific source of xenoestrogens and perhaps 
uh, the most key thing that you want to do in your life to prevent the absorption of these into the body is synthetic fiber clothing. So this would be polyester undergarments specifically when you have a bra on for the ladies out there or synthetic underwear, specifically polyester because that's the, the most widely used one that's synthetic. I mean nylon's just as bad but a lot, you look at the label of any um, uh, clothing and even if it's cotton, it's, unless it's organic cotton, you've got the pesticides and herbicides used on the cotton when it was grown. And cotton is actually one of those plants that requires a lot of maintenance by chemicals because of the way they now grow it and the way they've sped up the industry. Um, so unfortunately when you're wearing even regular cotton clothing or um, polyester clothing, if it's underwear it's even worse. You know, you've got testicular cancer and you've been wearing polyester underwear your whole life. That's uh, you, it's too bad you didn't come across that information sooner because that's a major factor. Same with a woman. Undergarments, polyester bras equals breast cancer. You just want to eliminate those completely. Um, I think there's definitely a market share for hemp, cotton, organic cotton that is, um, any of the other natural fibers. Uh, hemp on its own for undergarments isn't necessarily the most comfortable thing. It's quite a tough fiber. Um, so it can be combined with other fibers. But there's definitely a market for anyone looking for a, a good business idea of um, organic, all-natural fiber lingerie. And I know certain individuals that would be happy to have that opportunity because you see some of these organic cotton uh, underwear and they're not exactly the most uh, pleasing to the eye, let's just say. So, yeah, it's a new industry, but we will see things that are a little more tasteful with time. But yeah, the same thing goes with um, socks and pants and shirts. Yeah, you want to go all natural. And this is something you want to change over time, because I'm not saying throw your whole wardrobe unless you have the privilege to be able to do that financially. But I definitely say eliminating your polyester underwear, um, whether it's a bra or boxer shorts or women's underwear is more important than eliminating phytoestrogens and xenoestrogens in your food. Uh, this is rubbing against your body all day, you're sweating on it. Polyester sports clothing, that's insanely bad because you're sweating in it and then reabsorbing some of that sweat. And yeah, just don't use that stuff and throw that stuff out, especially stuff that's really close to the skin. On the topic of xenoestrogens and phytoestrogens, both of these are very much catabolic to the body because when we get excess estrogen happening um, it starts to train the body to start putting on fat and gaining weight uh, and mo no, I don't really know anyone that wants to gain weight in the, in the form of fat I think it's ridiculous if you do I think that's a good thing but uh, you definitely also don't want to be losing muscle mass and this stuff starts eating away at your muscles um, which is horrendous for anyone who's athletic and yet there's a uh, I'd have to hate to say it, but vegan bodybuilders who are using soy products or even flax products and they're just making their whole life harder. And that's I think that's partly why vegan and vegetarian bodybuilding over the years has not really seen any many people come up to being on par with some of the meat consuming uh, athletes of the equivalent nature. And I think it's these phytoestrogens in their main staple foods. But we're seeing more and more certain individuals like uh, Wade McNutt or uh, the raw nature boy, who are coming up and aren't using soy, aren't really, as far as I know, using much flax and uh, or excessive beans. So that's a good thing that we're going to start seeing that. Now I think everyone, even those working with bioidentical hormone specialists, need to eliminate the staple foods that are phytoestrogens and xenoestrogens, or rather the xenoestrogens that are in their environment. That just goes without saying that that's causing problems and it's not something that is hard to make a mistake on or tampering with because it's just not natural. We want to eliminate things that are not natural to us in that sense. Um, but where it gets tricky is when you get into playing with your hormones and that's when I recommend working with a practitioner um, and this is in the category of phytoandrogens and to a certain extent we, there are certain phytoandrogens which are regular foods and you can use uh, plenty of them in your diet because they're just things people eat anyways. Um, but if you're going to get really heavy into using a lot of different herbs that are phytoandrogens, um, 
plus you don't have the phytoestrogens in your diet, you naturally wouldn't want to be pushing yourself too far in the direction of having too much testosterone. 